Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. I want to welcome everybody that's online. Uh, so uh, good to be able to get together, whether it's here in person or whether you're joining us online, uh, wherever two or more are gathered, we can worship. And uh, it's so great to be able to uh, worship this morning, uh, lift up our voices to Jesus uh, and to just uh, see how holy he really is because he is holy. Uh, so let's all stand together as we start our worship. Holy is the Lord. <clears throat> We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father God, you are holy. And Father, we come this morning just to worship you and your son, Jesus, because there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for that gift that you gave us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming, for living a perfect life, 
for dying for our sins and raising again so that today we serve a risen Savior. And Father, we worship you this morning, giving you all glory, honor, and praise. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. seated. Continuing to worship together, Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path, thy word. It's important each and every week for us to remember uh, what Christ did for us on Calvary uh, by partaking of communion. Whether you're here or whether you're at home, uh, it's good to be able to take the Lord's Supper together. So let's be singing as we prepare, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory. Calvary. 
Good morning. This past week, I had my uh, second observation with my principal. That's basically part of my yearly evaluation to factor in whether I get to keep my job or not. Now, many of you have your own yearly reviews at your jobs, or if you don't, maybe at some point you've tried out or interviewed or auditioned for something. I feel that no matter how confident you are in what you do, the evaluation is always a little nerve wracking. You're being judged on your effectiveness for a year on maybe a two hour sample size. All it takes for one thing to go wrong to really throw your evaluation off. And that's why I'm thankful for this time. We gather around this table at communion to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We remember his beaten body by eating the bread. We remember his spilt blood by drinking the juice. We remember this because he took our evaluation. Without his sacrifice, the littlest white lie would have kept us out of heaven. However, with the gift of Jesus, we can be made perfect in him and pass our evaluation. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. There's nothing we can do on our own to achieve salvation. No matter how hard we work or how good we are, we'll always come up short if it's by our own works at our evaluation. Jesus has done the heavy lifting for us and offered us grace. It's a gift to us, and to pass our final evaluation, we just need to accept that gift that's offered to all and follow our team leader. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather around this table at this communion time, we just thank you for the gift you offer, that you were willing to come and be that perfect sacrifice so that we can cross the gap that we created and spend eternity in heaven with you. We just thank you for the willingness and the reminder that you've given with the bread that represents your broken body and the juice that represents your spilt blood. It's in your sons and we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, uh, let's stand together and sing Everlasting God.
can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, today I also pulled this um, offering meditation from tithe, uh, tithe.ly. <laughs> um, so each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. giver. 2 Corinthians 9.7. Have you ever listened to someone that makes you think, wow, they get it? Maybe it's a podcaster who articulates your political views very well, or a book that explains you better than you could explain yourself. But we all know what it's like to love finding some, someone who else who gets it, whatever it is. See, God loves everybody. But what he loves about a cheerful giver is that they get it. They get the connection between spiritual growth and generosity. They get that giving is, giving is itself a blessing to the giver. They get it. Not that those who aren't in a position to give don't get it, but there are far more of those who can and don't, and those who think they can't but probably could. To both of you, God says, I love a cheerful gift. Let us pray. Father God, we just come to you this morning to thank you for everything that you have done for us, all the way from giving us a beautiful sunrise to sending your son to live and die for us. Father God, we thank you for each and every day that we have. And it's in your wonderful son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to ask you to be praying with us uh, here in a moment, uh, just praying individually, silently. I'm going to ask that you add and remember Gene Bender. Uh, it's Debbie Barrett's dad. Uh, had some heart issues uh, last week necessitated him being taken to Grant where he remains with a stent uh, that was put in his heart. He's doing better, but just appreciate it if you would pray for Gene and Donna and their family uh, while he recovers. And I don't know, you might have some additions in the room, things we could share with the folks. Carrie? Okay, so it's Carrie Strong's mom, Lois, right, your mom, and then she's doing better and recuperating and home, and remember her dad, he's having a procedure tomorrow. So remember them. It's good to take more. It takes me longer now to look around the whole room because there's more people. It's exciting. I like it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good. To, it's like spring. It's like the church is waking up and coming back. So it's exciting. Anything else? Let's go ahead and, and take a few moments. I'll just encourage you to be able to pray silently, and then I'll close. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we continue to have uh, these opportunities to gather, to meet together uh, freely. We are mindful of government and laws and uh, challenges. We pray that you would keep us uh, vigilant and aware. We ask that we can continue to <clears throat> be able to reach out, to encourage, uh, to challenge, to come alongside those who are hurting, struggling, may they be uh, physical needs, spiritual, emotional concerns. Father, we're just grateful for those who have remained faithful uh, in this season, uh, whether physically able to be here or not, or whatever the season or the length or the, the, the weeks that have become months, Father, it is always good for us to be able to come together, uh, to be reminded of how much we know you 
provide for us every day in your comfort and grace and power and guidance. And we are grateful for how much is uh, provided for us by our church family and locally and around the world. Uh, we lift up Lazarus Fish and his family, the seminary, the students, the Christians, the nation as they uh, undergo such extreme difficulties and uh, measures. Father, we pray for safety, <clears throat> for peace for them. We lift up our missionaries who are serving in other lands uh, in whatever degree of, of difficulty, be it uh, through pandemic or other. We just pray that you would strengthen their hand for the work. Uh, strengthen us to that end this week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a question. You don't, you don't have to answer out loud, but just kind of think. What, what, are the, what are the pressing issues of the day? What are some of the topics that are always in the news? I mean, if you want to talk amongst your pew, that's fine. Or if you want to share on your couch, feel free. I don't know, but what, you know, what are some of the things that people post about most frequently? What might you be sick of hearing about or talking about? But let me ask you this, as you're thinking, as you're contemplating, as you're making that list of topics, did service make your list? It is the concept of serving people because I love God, is, is that one of the hot button issues that, that is, culture is consumed with? I'm going to say no. Okay? It's not. But we're going to propose this month, and Scripture will make the case that these four areas that we are going to touch on, amongst others, are essentials for us. Okay? They will be serving, the Holy Spirit, prayer, and worship. These essentials in any season. Okay? And I will grant you, I understand this Christian message, largely Christian audience from the Christian Bible. Uh, might not expect everybody in culture to, to agree with our list, but that, that is of no matter. <laughs> this is a list for us. And for us as believers, these four, among others, are always necessary, vital, applicable. I, I think we could argue if only we could lead or encourage more of the population to accept these as essential, we might not have some of the struggles in the news that we see today. So we're going to look at these four as essentials. Any season, uh, you'll find in the Gospel of John and I don't know if this particular title will be attractive to people when they're scrolling online or not. Um, it has the word Jesus in it, um, which is usually attractive to people when they're looking at our sermons. I'm like, oh, that one's about Jesus. But it also has the word service or serve in it. Uh, so maybe not so much for them. You know. Again, it doesn't matter. The point is for us. The point of this sermon, Jesus very simply, very clearly serves. It, it is an essential for us in any season, in any setting, in any climate, in any culture. Uh, it's vital that Christians be willing to serve other people like Christ did here. The account is from John chapter 13. I'm going to be reading the first verses of John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast. <clears throat> Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, do you not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. 
You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Okay, so there's the scene. Is, is anybody not getting the, the basic illustration here? A bunch of guys who have just walked, however far, in open-toed sandals on, I don't know how you say, dusty at best streets and alleys and passageways. And Jesus gets down essentially on his hands and knees and takes this bowl of water and patiently washes off 24 hairy-toed feet. Uh, I don't, maybe it'd be a powerful use of the sermon time if I just forego talking and I just made my way down the pews washing feet. Uh, that might be lost a little bit for the, the viewing audience. Um, we, we just don't have the same need, right? We don't have quite the same need in this culture, in this climate. Um, it's chilly out and most of us, I think, probably wore closed-toed shoes today. Um, we have boots and socks and pavement and carpet and it, it's just not quite the, the same need. The, the actual... Washing of the feet is the vehicle or the illustration, but service is a concept. That's the question. Am, am I willing to serve people? Um, this question, uh, statement really, service is to the end. Okay. Put that down. Jesus is just about to die. I don't know, 12 hours maybe? 24 at the most. And he spends part of his last day on earth washing grown men's dirty feet. And he knows, he knows he is returning to God. That's in verse 3. He doesn't have to do this. We often look at Philippians 2, 5, 6, 7, 8. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And he served right up to the end. I thought of the man named Stephen in serving the church in Acts 6 and 7. He's overseeing the, the distribution of food for the needs. Um, he's preaching. He's doing miracles. How long did that guy work at this? This is Acts 7, 59 and 60. While they were stoning him, throwing rocks at him to kill him, Stephen prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. To the end. Are, are you to that point yet? You, you might be feeling your age. A lot of us are. But am I to the end yet? Service to the end. Uh, Denise's mom, Georgina, sang with us a couple, couple Saturdays ago now. She is 91. Right? Her health is fading. Um, hospice has been contacted and they are involved. You know? And we have this visit and, and we laughed and, and we talked and we cried, just, you know, the, the full gamut of, of all the emotions. And we decided that we would sing a couple songs. They were old time hymns of the church. And we see her mom singing along through the glass, you know, but, and, and her face is drawn and it, it wasn't ideal. But when we were singing, you know, I could, you could just see it. That's, it's, you know, you have one of those visions that you never forget, you know, just through this little pane of glass, I can see her face and her mouth and just the contentment, you know, and, and the smile and the, the words just came naturally, you know. She said, I wasn't singing. You were. We, we saw you. you know? Sustained and enabled and 91 years old. And, and the time comes, you know, we have to leave. And, and she says, I have to stay here. Oh, and she's like, I don't know, what can I do here? I can't, how can I serve here? And we said, this is what you need to do. We need you to pray. We need you to pray for us. We need you to pray for the staff. Is there, is there ever, a, when can you not pray? Talk about serving to the end. What, what do you physically need to be able to do to lift up others in prayer? And I'm, I already told you we're going to talk about it. I'm giving you a two-week warning because we're going to talk about prayer in a couple weeks, so I'm going to come back to it and ask, how would I do? <clears throat> now, most of us are, are living somewhere between age-wise Georgina and probably Vivian. You know, we're, we're somewhere, somewhere in the middle of there. Well, none of us get to opt out of serving because we're old or tired or sick 
or there's been a pandemic, or I don't want to wear a mask, or I'm just tired, or, or whatever. It's not on. Revelation 2.10, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Nobody retires from serving as a Christian. Now, I understand and be aware that service might not fit your giftedness. <laughs> you, you might say, I'd, I'd rather leave. And we say, well, it, it's serve. And I want to share here in a moment, I want to share a clip of a young woman. This is one of those post-wisdom teeth extraction videos you know, where, where people have had the gas or they're on the drug or whatever, and the comments that they make are, are kind of funny. It has captions on it, but see if we can play this scene of this girl after her wisdom teeth. Yes, and leave it in there. God is in my mouth. I am real careful, so I'm chewing up. Oh my God. <laughs> no, God's not in your mouth. God's is in your mouth. Like God's Is that adding. God's brother? No, honey. <laughs> I don't know where I had a brother. It's not God's Her brother. Her friend is not doing a good job at Sunday school because she did not tell me that God had a brother named Guys. Man, he has a short end of the stick there. One gets to be the whole my almighty and the other one is just some baby to up and chew on. <laughs> This makes me laugh every time. I... <laughs> but that, G, of the two, Jesus is more like gauze here in the, in, the, in, the, in the scene. You know, talk about getting the short end of the stick. This is a Passover meal. This is a holiday celebration. And he's washing feet. You know? All, everything that he has already done, everything that he's able to do, his power, his wisdom, his leadership, <clears throat> he has no insecurity at all about his status or his future. He knows where he's going. And he's washing feet. Teacher, Lord, servant. That's, that's the problem that, that Peter has. That's exactly what's going on in, in Peter's mind. You know, you're, you're not going to wash my feet, the message says, ever. Because you know, he knows. He's, you're God. You know? I, I'm, thrilled, I'm thrilled that currently we have a, quite a number of young people who are studying. You got Ethan and Cherish are going to Kentucky Christian, um, Tories at Liberty, uh, Galena Young, her fiance Alex, you know, young people who want to serve the church uh, in this position. And I thought, man, I'm, if I could teach a class or if I was given an opportunity to guest lecture in that, it would be this. You know, if you want to lead the church, serve the church. You know, and it's not always going to be on the stage with the lights and the microphones. But you got to be ready, and, and you got to be willing. It's it's not always going to be in the comfortable sanctuary setting where we have all the, the tools and the tech and the team and the temperatures pretty much just what we want but you got to be ready you got to be if i want to lead the church effectively on sunday i have to be willing to serve the church the other six days and i, I look like in the old testament i love in nehemiah the account of rebuilding the walls of jerusalem in chapter three who rebuilds the walls contractors no Mason's local 256? No. This is the very first sentence of, of Nehemiah 3.1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. I'm pretty sure those guys didn't have a masonry class in seminary. But that's what needed done that day. Um, this is verse 8. Uziel, son of Harhaniah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. And I, I know we call diamonds, rock, like a big diamond is a rock, <laughs> but that's as close as those guys are going to get. And these rocks are way bigger than any rocks that the jewelers have set previously. It's outside his normal, what he trained for, but that's what needs done. You know, I always default to Gregor asked me to help deliver that lamb. I'm never going to forget. I, I don't know how many times you've heard, you know, the, the local farm people, the Oars farm they call, and he says, hold that you down because I need to pull this lamb out. And she's not going to appreciate it, but it has to happen. And I'm sitting there the whole time thinking, man, all seminary classes and shepherd and sheep, but I never had anything about actually pulling the lamb out. You know, <laughs> this is not something I studied in class. Um, there, there was a, one day you could have come in the office and I still had blood stains. I washed off the best I could, blood on my hands and wrist of my shirt because one of the church members had hit a deer. And she said, well, we want to eat it. Do you know how to process? I said, yeah, I do. So again, I don't know if you have that in class, but you might want to <laughs> be ready for that because it might come up. 
You know? um, I know a, a fellow minister, and I, I don't need to give all the details, but it was just a, a home visit, and it just, hygiene was suspect. Well, that's enough, you know. But he just, he went through the house, and, and then was, was given some snacks, we'll just say. You know, like, eat up. And he was, like, he was probably thinking, I'd rather wash feet. <laughs> you know? But that's just how it goes. Uh, Mark 10, 43. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. And scholars have studied, and you know this, that, that in the first century, Roman Empire, power and wealth were idolized. Humility, meekness, serving, that, that's weak. That, that's why what Jesus does here is so radical. And now here we are 2,000 years later, what has become of the mighty Roman Empire? And what has become of the kingdom of Jesus? No. And I understand, like, talking about what you're skilled or trained to do, I understand the balance between Jesus doing very menial, shall we say, the dirty work here in John 13, balance that with these apostles who later in Acts 6, 7 will have to say, we, we have to balance. You know, we can't afford to be waiting on tables, Acts 6, 2. It wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word. That, and that's especially, you know, for studying and degrees and things. And you have to balance back and forth but there's a, di there's a difference between claiming, well, I can't help with this ministry over here right now because I am diligently and actively engaged in this for which I am uniquely gifted. I'll give you that. There's a difference between that and just kind of looking at that and saying, yeah, I really don't want to do that. It's kind of dirty. That's kind of beneath me. You know? And that, that's not just for people who are paid, so to speak. You know? if, if you want to be a Christian... And, and that attitude of <laughs> that's kind of beneath me, it's, it's going to be tough for you. you know? if, I don't know if you ever find yourself contemplating whether or not you want to serve this particular person in that particular way. If, if it's tough for you, just bring to mind that Jesus washed Judas's feet. You know? and, and that reminds us that serving is open to everybody. Serving is expected of, of everyone. <clears throat> you, you may be uniquely trained or skilled or gifted in a, in a particular aspect of work, but this is an example. For, does anybody have any how-to classes for foot washing? I, even, I Googled that, and there wasn't even a video for that. <laughs> Not in a whole... Now, there, to be clear, I Googled washing others' feet, and there was nothing. Wash your own feet, they'll teach you. There's like five or six of how to wash your feet. So it, just watch that and then do it. It's feet or feet, you know? <laughs> if you learn how to wash your own feet, wash their feet. You know, verse 5, it's, it's a very basic example. And we can focus on how dirty the job was. But it's a very necessary job. And people serve in necessary ways. Um, STNAs, Ohio has STNAs. And I, when I looked it up, we're the only state that uses that particular designation. It stands for State Tested Nurse Aids. What kind of work do nurse aids? It's, it's necessary work. And it can be bathing and dressing and skin care, and there's a lot of servant heart in that kind of work. The issue here is not whether you are paid to serve the church. It's, it's not a breakdown where you say part-time paid puts in part-time effort. No, it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're paid or not. You know? The issue is a willing heart. And, and I've known, you probably have too, known some people who were paid by a church and they weren't really servants. And you know other people who were never paid a dime. But they were wonderful servants. Still are. Um, that's Dorcas, Tabitha, Acts chapter 9. What's she always doing? Helping the poor. Making robes. I, I guess I have in my mind that Dorcas was older. I don't know that I saw in the text that, that she was. Um, I'm pretty sure she wasn't paid in, in for the ministry part. But she has a servant heart. It's evident. 1 Timothy 5.10, they're making a list of widows who can be supported by the church, and there's a, a break in there where it says most of them hopefully had family who could support them, but some didn't. So we had to determine who should be on the list, and you can see it there. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Washing the feet right there. And they said even in that day it was probably like uh, illustrative or an example. Well, it didn't have to be just exactly that. But 
just in that category. <clears throat> Raising kids, a service. Servant's heart. Helping people who are in trouble. That for all of us, of all ages, of all vocations, we're all, all expected to serve. Old and young. Um, the, the church, Christian home, needs to be the place today where we are teaching the kids to serve. You do not exist solely to be pampered and babied. You know, part of what you need to learn is how to work, how to serve, how to give. Uh, 1 Samuel 2.18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. How old do you think Samuel was when he started serving? A lot of scholars will tell you, maybe three. And if you remember the story, his mother had prayed. Hannah's praying for a child. She said, Lord, you give me a son, I'll bring him here to serve you. And that exactly, God said, okay. She said, here he is. And he learned, and he grew up there. And every year his mom would come with the family and bring him a new robe and visit with him. Um, what do you think serve meant? For, you know, does it just mean follow Eli around like a puppy? You know? But the idea of serving, as in to the point where God speaks to the boy. That, that's the degree of his chapter 3, verse 1. It says he's still a boy. But God gives him in the middle of the night a message a vision. It's pretty important service for, for a little kid. And what he learned early, he practiced the rest of his days. Am I teaching, even the young ones, to serve? <laughs> I thought about it. It doesn't mean I'm asking you to drop your little kids off at church tonight so they can sleep here all night and give me a message from God in the morning, you know, and wake up the door and there's a little one going, God told me this. You know? But that's it's serving, and I want to make sure it's outside the walls of the church. Too. I found a wonderful illustration of people of all ages serving. And I want to tell you the written part that I found, and then we'll show you a video that says, summarizes it from NPR. But this started 10 days after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, 41. And the residents of North Platte, Nebraska, heard a rumor that some of the guys from their town who were in Nebraska National Guard Company D. They're going to be coming through town on the troop train that's taking them west. So they said, let's get together and show them our appreciation. Said 500 people showed up at the train depot, and they had goods and gifts and letters and just love. Well, the train rolls in, and it's, it's not Nebraska Company D. It's the boys from Kansas Company D. It's their train. And the locals said, hey, let's go ahead and just give these boys that they didn't know all the stuff that we have. It says it was a spontaneous act of genuine devotion that touched both soldiers and the people who came to the depot. So a few days later, a then 26-year-old lady, Ray Wilson, wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper. She said that was so monumental, that was touching, that was impactful for them and for us. She said, how about we organize a canteen and we provide that for other troop trains as, as they come through town. And she said, I will volunteer to lead the effort. For the next four and a half years, the people in North Platte, Nebraska, and the surrounding communities then, met every troop train that came and stopped in their town every day. They made sandwiches, cookies, cold drinks, hot coffee, magazines, books, letters, uh, special occasions, they found out somebody's birthday, they made him a cake. You know, and they did it. On some, some days, some single days, they served 8,000 soldiers and sailors. And troop train movements were somewhat restricted, so you didn't even really know when they were going to come. Said so the statistics are staggering. By the time the last train arrived on April 1st, 1946, six million soldiers had been blessed by the North Platte Canteen. They had by then amassed 45,000 volunteers. And they served faithfully, where we started, to the end of the war. And the troops were home. And this is from NPR. It illustrates the same thing. Just before we got to North Platte, one of the MPs on the train came up to me and uh, uh, said, this next stop's going to be something you'll never forget. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's the North Platte Canteen. It'll be the best stop you ever made across the United States. It was just as if they started a factory here, a war factory. Instead of making bullets or making something else, they made food for all of us coming through. I had a glass of milk because we didn't have milk very often in the service. I had a glass of milk. I had a beef sandwich made with homemade bread. I had a cookie. I had a donut. 
They offered me pie. They offered me cake. They offered popcorn balls. Then they had fruit. I just can't get over how pleased those people were that we would accept what they were offering. I no sooner got off the train and a lady walked up to me with a birthday cake and asked me if it was my birthday. I told her it wasn't. She said, we're going to make it your birthday here in North Platte and handed me this beautiful birthday cake. It was an atmosphere uh, that you felt when you got off the train in North Platte that uh, made you feel like you were a hero. And we'll give you a little bit of the rest of the story. This is just for us. Stan Bean is from that North Platte area. And his uncle, Ed Dunn, stopped on way through, had a meal in 42. Uh, Stan has or has access to a book about the canteen that was written by Bob Green. Bob's a very well-known author. And Bob Green learned of the canteen because Cal Robinson, who was a deacon who attended Valley Christian Church in North Platte with the Bean family, got a hold of him and said, you need to write this up to be remembered. How long did they do that? Four years, every day. 45,000 servant hearts of all ages helping six million soldiers. And I, I didn't ask Dan, he may know, how, how many of those 45,000 were members of the Valley Christian Church? You know, how many believers who not only sat in a pew on Sunday morning, but they lived out Jesus' example every day of the week? That, that's the end of this text, verse 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. No. And I still have this mask it was left in my office a few weeks ago. I hope you can tell by the lipstick it's not mine. You know, hey, Chick, it's yours. You can come and get it. She left it in my office a couple, I don't know how long ago when we had that sermon, we talked about there's opportunities to volunteer at Heartbeats in Newark. And then Chick came in to pick up the paperwork, the application to serve. You know. Can you see Jesus washing these guys' feet. If, if you close your eyes, can you see Jesus serving? If you close your eyes, can you see the ways that Jesus has served you in your lifetime? That's important because the more clearly I can see how God has served me and loved me, the more equipped and the more willing I am to serve other people. The, the world, the culture, our families, they might not always be super appreciative. Well, serving at times is draining and demanding. And you're going to get dirty and you're going to get sore. And you might be tempted to be discouraged. But can I close my eyes and see Jesus washing feet just hours before he gives up his life? And Gary Berge said that's, that's the source of the power. He tied it to 1 John 4.10. <clears throat> Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And he put it this way. He said, without a prior life-consuming experience of God's love for us, we will be ill-equipped to go serve anybody else. And it's true. You've seen it. That's what characterizes the lives of people who give themselves. Profound act of Christian service. The story of their journey always begins with an encounter of God's goodness to them. It never fades for them. When you look at the Apostle Paul in the New Testament transforming experience, right? When he meets the Lord, he becomes a servant of the one who serves him. You know? and, and depending on how long you've been with us, we'll just say he was a jolly little man named Joe. You know? And we would say the same about Joe Haley, being on fire you know, for the Lord, a modern day Paul. And if, you, and if you ever asked him, and I asked him, man, what fuels you? What would he tell you? I, for lack of a better term, wasted about 50 years of my life. And God has been very gracious, and he was patient, and he has changed my life and poured so much into me. I have so much to share and so much time I can't get back. And another person among how many I could give you who served right up to the end, served as needed, served when needed. I want to serve like that. I, I want to serve like Jesus. 
Let's pray. Father God, we are mindful of opportunities that are afforded us. Uh, Our lives, our circles, uh, our abilities grow and diminish and and change and are uh, rearranged through the years as our bodies get tired, as our Uh, minds become full. We know that there might be days and times and ways in which we will serve in different venues and and, and aspects and opportunities than before. But Father, you need all of us and and you equip all of us uh, from the youngest among us to be able to serve your people, not just in the church building on Sunday morning, but through the week. Not just your people, but people in our towns, our schools, our workplace, uh, people who need your grace. And we pray that we can serve them and be reminded of how you serve us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Uh, The invitation remains open as we make our way here to the front to sing. Um, It's an appropriate title. Just Come just as you are right now, however dirty you feel like your feet or your life might be, but to come and to give your life to the Lord. Um, He is willing, he is able. Let's stand together, we'll sing, come just as you are. Is the Holy Spirit moving you this morning? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Whether you're here in the room or whether you're online, there's no greater decision you'll ever make than to accept him. You can do that here this morning by coming forward. If you're online, you can contact us. Um, I've never got a text, though I've given my number, so maybe I give it too fast. It's 740-4. Zero five five three three nine. You text that, I'll wait for you. Because you need to know Jesus. I know some people I think say, Well, when I get over this huge sin that I'm battling, then I'll then I'll think about it. Well, Jesus takes you as you are, and he will help you to overcome whatever you may be stuck in. So I urge you, don't let today go by. Come just as you are. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. See you.
Again, just thankful that you can be here with us. I just appreciate uh, so many people. It's just been a, a long season, and just the blessings of being able to have vaccines and other things available. Just exciting every Sunday uh, to see that and witness that. And we encourage you, if you want to stay <clears throat> and study with us uh, yet this morning, and then youth group from 12 to 1. And I, I know Bob has one that Bob made Mark and I aware of some things that are happening in Washington laws and things we need to be aware of. I'll um, give him time here in a minute to remind us of that and the Easter memorial flowers need to be ordered by next Sunday if you want to place flowers here we'll decorate for Easter Sunday and then if you're here in person you can take them home that same day if you want after the service but there's an order form out there in the foyer and there is a page guys if you want to sign up to come and eat for the bean the beanless bean dinner <laughs> which is now pulled pork and so um, but if you want to try that on the 18th and if you Anybody, any age, if, if you want to make a pie, you can mark that too. We'll, we'll gladly eat pies here and, and keep them here. So, and then Bob, if you want to update us on that, yeah. what you read. You guys, you guys can have a seat. It's going to take a, <clears throat> this is almost meditation length. So, um, but I just wanted to, I kind of felt compelled to bring this to your attention and I brought it to Mark and, and Kevin the other day, but uh, in Congress right now, this is going on. Um, and we try to stay away from overtly political stuff when it comes to bringing any kind of message, especially from up here uh, at the pulpit, being during a meditation or a sermon or, or whatever. But, um, and the IRS does frown upon taxes and uh, entities advocating for or against specific candidates, so I will not be doing that. Um, let me be clear about that. And I think I can speak for Kevin and Mark, and I know I can because they, they read this, so I imagine they agree. When I say we will not tell you who we think you should vote for, uh, when acting in our positions in this congregation. So let's get just, I want to set that aside. But having said that, I felt compelled, as I said, to make you aware of something called House Resolution 5, which passed the U.S. House of Representatives, I believe, on March 2nd. Um, and it's otherwise known as the Equality Act. Uh, it's only about 28 pages long, which is strange for stuff out of, out of uh, Washington these days. But uh, so you can read it, and I encourage you to. And if you live in Ohio District 3, which is generally Columbus, but districts are weird, um, your representative, Joyce Beatty, uh, is listed as a co-sponsor of this bill. Um, in short, what the act does is add sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity to the list of protected classes in the Civil Rights Act. And additionally, it expands the definition of public accommodations to include places or establishments that provide one, exhibitions, recreation, exercise, amusement, gatherings, or displays, two, goods, services, or programs, and three, transportation services. And again, I want to be very clear, every human has the right to be treated with dignity and respect regardless of their race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or anything else. Um, and I would add that regardless of their status as born or unborn as well, but that's a different discussion, although the matter of abortion is tangentially related to, to this bill. The biggest issue that I have with the act itself is that it states explicitly, and this is going to sound legalese, but I'll explain in a second, <laughs> the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 shall not provide a claim concerning or a defense to a claim under a covered title or provide a basis for challenging the application or enforcement of a covered title, which basically means you can't use the Re religious, religious Freedom Restoration Act as a basis for a defense against any lawsuit under the Equality Act if it's passed. And as I understand it, to the extent that the Little Sisters of the Poor won a few court cases here and there where the government tried to compel them to provide abortion coverage, they won those cases using the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so when you couple that with the idea with the, uh, that the Equality Act expands its reach to places that provide gatherings or programs, I don't think it's a stretch to see, that this, is, see this as a threat to how churches such as ours continue to operate and provide a place for homeschools or voting or VBS or trail life or any of the other myriad things that we provide this facility for. If you're at the congregational meeting, you'll remember that I read the We Believe statements uh, for the Church of Christ of Alexandria. And a fair reading of the bill, I think, could make it difficult to say the least to take actions based on those beliefs 
particularly when it comes to same-sex marriage, but it would also affect the missions that we support, such as the Christian Children's Home and Heartbeats. The resolution passed the House by 18 votes. It doesn't appear that the Senate is looking to consider it just yet, and it would presumably have to get beyond the 60-vote threshold there. However, you never know what can happen, and I have no doubt that if the Senate were to pass this bill, President Biden would sign it. I'm asking you to take a look at it. I'm asking you to take action individually as you see fit. Senators Brown and Portman certainly need to hear what you think. We don't currently have any plan to take actions on behalf of the congregation officially, but we are open to your thoughts on the subject, whether you think we should do something about it or act, or whether you think it's best that we not stir the pot as an organization. But that's all that I have, and thank you for listening. Let's go ahead, and uh, I'll let you stay seated, but why don't we go ahead and pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for this time that we have come able to worship, uh, able to do so freely. Father, I pray that you give us a servant's heart. Uh, Father, help us to serve others, to show your love. Uh, Father, to be able to show your, the grace that you've given us so we can show that to others so they will want what we have, which is you. Father, thank you uh, for the time that we've had. I ask that you keep everyone safe as we leave this place. And Father, help us to make an impact uh, to our community, to our state, to our nation, and to our world. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for the many blessings you give us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll ask that. Will you please stand as we sing uh, the closing song, O Lord, You're Beautiful. See you. 